Smuggle what? For starters, how about bringing girls over here for purposes of prostitution? That one we know about. You need to do better for a wiretap. Read your annotated code. Wiretap statute subsection 10406 designates crimes where telephonic communication can be intercepted in the great state of Maryland. Prostitution? Uh-uh. You mean you can tap a guy's phone if he's selling drugs, but if he's selling women, he's out of bounds? That's the law. Alex Cottrell and Toby Huntingford present Caught on the Wire. This podcast is an episode-by-episode analysis of HBO's widely acclaimed TV series about the city of Baltimore, its people, and its many problems. Find more information about the show and all the episodes online at caughtonthewire.wordpress.com. We are back. Uh, We had our little break and... uh, recharged our wire analysis batteries and here we are with episode seven backwash uh toby i know you had a nice little trip in france in our time whilst we were away yes absolutely yeah um just been over to france really been to reims a nice little champagne region just to the east of paris um i was game to uh dedicate myself to the wire over there for another week um but uh it was decided between us that we should perhaps take one week off in the middle and uh, just, as you say, recharge our batteries so that we don't uh, fry out each week. And uh, I'm glad we're making progress. We've done a good, what's that, season and a half. So about a third of the way through our podcast. I don't know what we're going to do by the time we come to the end of it. It's kind of a scary prospect. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, closing yeah. in. You kind of don't realise how much you've done. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, we are we are rifling through it. But it's 60, 60 weeks in total, isn't it, plus any extras in between. So it's still quite, yeah. a, quite a task ahead of us. We're giving ourselves a very sort of generous amount of breaks, so um, it may take us a good two or three years to get through it all. <laughs> you never know, but um, no, nah, it'll, yeah. it'll be fine. It'll be fine, yeah. Keep we've, cranking uh, them out. Yeah, we've been going for more than six months, which is what I can't believe. It still feels like we're right at the kind of early stages, but uh, we started right in the height of summer. Hmm. Yeah, way back when. Yeah. So to uh, move us on to the the show or sort of pre-show. We have our little listeners' corner, which is where we normally do emails and the like. And um, we did get a message from our reg- uh, regular contributor, Damon, who sent us a message which reads, uh, Hey, fellas, curious. As Brits, what do you think of McNulty's fake accent when he pretends to be James Cromwell in season two? I get that it's purposely supposed to be bad. Also, uh, Dominic West and Idris Elba, do you think they disguise their accents well? I think we've touched on the topic of McNulty's accent a couple of times because it does slip quite a bit in the first two seasons. Um, I mean, the fir- the very first scene of The Wire, yeah, the snot boogie scene, I mean, his accent there is really kind of... It's not quite honed, is it? It seems fine. It's just that it's... Particularly the phrase snot boogie is snot very difficult boogie. to kind of get right, isn't it, on the... On, in terms of the American style. And boogie is such a British word, you can really make that O go on forever. And you have to really, you know, find the right way to nail it. So it's kind of an odd one. But, uh, yeah, he gets he gets a lot better. And particularly mm. by season three, he's very consistent. There doesn't really seem to be any noticeable slips. Um, it's funny he mentions it now, actually, Damon, because uh, I think only a couple of episodes to go until we get to our uh, James Cromwell incident, which I absolutely love when McNulty uh, almost adopts this little alter ego for a few seconds and uh, tries to go back to his old ancestors and uh, fake a British accent that he's already not faking. It's kind of a really weird um, contrast. I thought James Cromwell was that guy who was in Babe. <laughs> he's, he's all sorts of people, but Cromwell <laughs> is, is the quintessential British name we'll go with. So It's a famous yeah. British name. Yeah, oh, it's of course Oliver... Oliver um, Cromwell. Warts yeah, and all. Definitely. definitely. But it's a strange scene because it's him doing uh, an impression of an accent whilst doing an impression of an accent. And his impression of that accent, of that impression of that accent, is absolutely, you know, it's kind of flawless. It's exactly yeah, it is really good. <laughs> how a British person or an American person would try and do British, I, I think, from what I've heard. Um, so it's that bit's done very well. Uh, on the topic of Idris Elba. Mm. Um, He's much more consistent, isn't he, really? He seems to have nailed 
he adopts a very different accent. Um, he's obviously got more of an African American twang to it, um, but it's it's certainly more consistent. And I think you, you can identify a couple of slips, definitely, particularly in those long uh, soliloquies and speeches that he gives to his uh, minions. But uh, he's uh, on the whole a, a lot stronger than McNulty, I think, really, and Dominic West at, at nailing American. The Stringer always, you know, as a character, he speaks with a lot of purpose. He doesn't really make it's those moments where he makes those more long speeches that are a lot more rare, I would say, compared to a lot of characters. He seems a lot more to the point. So as a result, I guess there's l- you get these short, sharp phrases instead that are less slip ups in them. And when he starts having those longer speeches i guess it's more opportunity to slip up but generally speaking i would say that idris elba's accent is pretty damn good like oh yeah you don't kind of you know you you totally buy into it and i've been watching quite a bit of um the u.s office recently uh, which is brilliant by the way i really like it um and he plays a character in that he's like a manager that comes in and he has to do an american accent in that and again it's very good so he's clearly sort of Clearly, a skill that he's honed as an actor, something he's focused on. Because as a British actor, you can kind of get more work if you can do a convincing American accent and appear in American TV shows. Yeah, I, I didn't realise he'd he'd come onto the office. I assume it must be in a quite a late season, is it? Or yeah, I think it's like oh. season six, season seven, something like that. He, oh, okay. He's not in it much. He's, he only has like a kind of minor role. But uh, does he just rehash his Stringer accent, or does he really go for a different kind of character? It's slightly or? different. It's a bit more neutral. Yeah. But because um, they're supposed to be in Pennsylvania, um, so yeah, yeah, it's it's, okay. it's a bit more neutral, I would say. Also, it's a comedy, so I guess there's less, you know, there's less importance on the whole seriousness and how realistic it is. Yeah. Especially in the office, yeah, which for being a mockumentary is still pretty zany. Definitely, I mean, he's he's taken off massively, hasn't he, uh, Idris Elba? I mean, when The Wire was doing his rounds, Idris was really much. Uh, an unknown he was just as unknown as much of the cast but it was i think luther the the british police show really launched him and he na- he's now on all sorts of adverts and the face of all sorts of products and there's lots of talks about him being the next james bond to follow in daniel craig's footsteps so his career's really taken off quite late because idris is getting on a bit now he's really got some some greys uh popping out so yes yeah, it's, um it's interesting it's a common uh, complaint raised about actors from the wire is that they're also they're also brilliant and they're all captured these incredible characters and yet you don't see many of them getting high profile work where they could provide that level of quality on a sort of triple a level um i say triple a that's not really a good term to use but you know what i mean yeah like a, a kind um, of a hollywood yeah box office level yeah exactly yeah so but idris elba is one actor who has done very well out of it like he really like you say he really has shot to fame and when he was doing luther i i did kind of get a sense that his notoriety as stringer bell did follow him there to some extent there was this sense that he was going to be playing this you know dark crime oriented character again so yeah it made sense definitely yeah yeah he's uh he's very deserving of the uh of the attention he gets he's a great actor so um yeah speaking of stringer i think my first section is uh a Barksdale themed. Mm. So should we think about jumping into our recap for this week? Yeah, I think it's time to get going with uh, the episode proper. Okay, so um had fewer strands this week, slightly more focused stories. Um we're missing obviously uh Omar and the Greeks and uh McNulty has a very stripped back role and the Jane Doe's investigation is now folded into the Sabotka detail. So things are kind of um, stripping down a bit. So we've kind of got three big themes. We've got the Barksdales, we've got the Sabotka detail and we've got the dock business. And uh, I've split each one up into little bits. So we've got 11 sections today, some longer, some shorter. And I'm going to kick off with our funeral flowers uh, scene. So... Uh, Bodhi Broadus buys a fla- uh, floral arrangement for D'Angelo's funeral and orders it to look like the high-rise tower that D'Angelo controlled before his demotion. The 221 building. So that's our first one. Okay, that's, so this is yeah. the interesting reveal that a, a flower shop in Baltimore has a sort of ghetto section. 
Oh, yeah, there's all these like AK-47s and stuff in floral displays and the change of character that we see from the guy in the shop. Whereas first he's kind of a bit more traditionally kind of shop floor professional and then as he builds a rapport with uh, with Bodhi, understands who he is and kind of slips quite naturally into the role that brings him around the back towards this sort of extra hidden section around the corner that people don't normally see, presumably. <laughs> well, it depends. Yeah, if if it's out in the out in the ghetto, maybe it's the it's their kind of cash cow section. Mm. You never know. But it's it's great that they they've you know they've they've adapted their shop to reflect that market if there clearly is one for it, and we've seen it here. Yeah, it's just business, I suppose. Yeah, just business. And it's interesting to see Bodhi's perception of what happened to D'Angelo as well. We kind of see that passed on information to him and the way that he sees it and how he feels about it. And, you know, as the viewer, we kind of know the real truth. So you get a lot of that in this episode, kind of seeing people's perception on what they've been told and hearsay and how the stories have been passed on. Yeah. And that uh, that element of communication that's so important in The Wire, the accuracy of that communication and how it's uh, passed along the chain. Chinese whispers, I suppose, to some extent, but... Definitely. They, the Bark Stars wanted to make the message very clear here, and everyone, including Bodhi, says that D'Angelo was weak, and that's kind of the message they want to portray. That's like the propaganda, I suppose, of the Barksdale organisation. <clears throat> yeah, well, it was certainly challenged in our love for Bodhi, as we remember that you know Bodhi and D'Angelo are cut from very different cloths, and um, I think Bodhi's talking more about the time he spent with D'Angelo, perhaps, than more the fact that he hung himself and. Bodhi knew D'Angelo well on the pit, but he never agreed with his management style and always thought, thought that he you know, he chose the weak man's road and wasn't strict enough with punishments and discipline. Um, so may, maybe that's really where his comments come from. Um, and uh, it was interesting to see that perspective on it that we might have forgotten that Bodhi has, uh, and we still love him nonetheless. Um, so I thought that was cool. And just seeing the, the mix between the the florist and the and Bodhi himself and their kind of perspective on what it means to mourn someone or to um uh you know what memorial services really mean and uh, Bodhi didn't seem to quite get it like sorry just wasn't a word that computed in Bodhi's mind <laughs> and uh, there's that final shot of the traditional angel figure before it cuts to the titles, which I thought yeah. was uh, quite a striking, very kind of safe, that traditional sense, like you were talking about how people handle grief and how they handle ceremony towards uh, the passing of other people and these two worlds colliding. It's a very yeah. nice uh, move from the show to kind of have it in that floral shop. And I think we see that shop again as well, don't we? That's Flores, right, yeah, I think that Prop Butchie's Joe visits... Funeral. That's right, yeah, yeah, a good memory, yeah. Uh, it was definitely season five, I remember. Um, Prop Joe orders some stuff from there, and we see the, the florist again, which is a really nice callback. That's season um, five? Yeah, yeah we've got, so a, uh, we've got a long way to go yet, dude. But we will get there. And, uh, yeah, so it was, it was cool. Yeah, nice little opening scene. Um, our second Barksdale Strand is about... Uh, the morning of D'Angelo's loss. So let's jump in. Stringer Bell visits Brianna uh, at her house for D'Angelo's wake and finds her inconsolable. In the prison, Avon and Weebay discuss D'Angelo's suicide. Unaware that Stringer Bell had engineered the murder while having the assassin make it look like a suicide, Avon is despondent over his nephew's death. Still, Avon musters enough anger at the selfishness of the act to dismiss D'Angelo as weak to both Stringer and Weebay. Again, another um, contrast of reactions. There's uh, the reveal of Brianna sitting on the bed and uh, you know, it's quite an upsetting scene the way Stringer enters and it kind of slowly pans around to her there and, like you, like you say, inconsolable. And then Avon's response is also upsetting but for a different reason because he seems very disdainful, kind of feels that resentment for what Dee did and they talk about him doing it, him doing something that the family would have to carry. Like, he mm. knew that they would have to deal with it. Um, so, again, kind of that Avon's perspective on it there. Um, and Donette is really kind of like, she's just, we kind of don't see anything from her, really. Yeah, There's they... no real attempt to kind of 
sort of lean in on what she's what her reaction is and how she's dealing with it because there just doesn't even seem to be much of a reaction. She's still there yeah. in all her fancy clothes and everything, and she's just There's certainly not much it. not much connection anymore. And she's looking at things very pragmatically, um, which is probably what Stringer wants. Really, is just she's the example that Stringer wants everyone to follow, I imagine. And uh, it was interesting what you're saying with Avon. We really see kind of an ego driven response to the death. He he's making it all about him, and that D'Angelo knew Avon would be in this position, thinking of this about D'Angelo and. Uh, it was a, a, an interesting way to look at it, but it was it was really nice to see Avon out of his comfort zone, really having a bit of a, an emotional quandary. And we see a very, very strong theme come out with what Weebay tries to advise him with, that, you know, that this shit ain't on you. And it's just the way the street deals with conscience. They just always blame their wrongdoings on something else and carry on. And that's the only way they can kind of function and do what Donette does and become pragmatic about death and become numb to it. So... Um, obviously with D'Angelo it's very difficult because he occupies a, a place a big place in the Barksdale heart but um, it's, it's good to see Avon really struggling with it yeah and um, also I thought it was a bit telling that uh, the scene with uh, Brianna String is wearing quite a sort of blood red shirt as he consoles her ah uh, yeah so it's a guilty party right there. Yeah. You can you can really tell Stringer's very much a closed person, but he you can really see the, the stress on his face when he's having to sit through the funeral and kind of try and console Brianna. It, you know, it's really kind of ripping under his skin uh, what he did to, to D'Angelo, no doubt. I thought he... I mean, I, I thought he was very cold in this episode. He yeah. was just absolutely brutal. <laughs> going around we, a lot of kind of this section that we're talking about here is stringer doing his rounds to some extent the kind of the follow-up to his actions and mm. yeah he's just so cold you just he doesn't have much of a reaction to anyone else he's there to console others and like you say you would like to know exactly what he's thinking about it it's just trying to push it out of his mind maybe yeah absolutely so it's just a case of riding through this bit and later on, once once it's died down, we're back to normal, and his decision will have proved proven kind of a useful one, at least in his eyes. Um, so the next one, <clears throat> yeah, sure. Um, oh, I guess we also need to talk about. Um, oh, here we go, number three, perfect. We need to talk about D'Angelo's funeral. So. Uh, the funeral is well attended, and Bodhi's over-the-top floral arrangement garners compliments. After the ceremony, Prop Joe approaches Stringer to discuss sharing his supply for a share in the Barksdale organization's profits, noting that the word on the street is that the deteriorating quality of the Atlanta product is nearly unacceptable to the junkies. Stringer pragmatically agrees to present the idea to Avon during his next visit to the prison. When he does so, however, Avon angrily dismisses it out of hand. And Stringer's just going to go ahead and do it anyway. Um, and I think we mentioned before about how he was emboldened with how he's got away with D'Angelo, and I guess he's going to press it even more because this is the beginning of the co-op. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting to see Stringer's point of view on it. He's kind of taking that cold businessman approach, he's going for what's best for business, what's going to keep the money flowing. He's clearly not bothered by the sacrifice. He doesn't see the kind of territorial element that Avon sees it. There's a a matter of saving face. Um, and it's interesting when Stringer brings up the names of previous people that they had to beat to get the towers. I don't remember any of the, the names that he mentions, but he kind of talks about this hidden history of these mysterious gangsters that they presumably had to either kill or remove one way or another in order yes. to get those towers. And uh, Avon's not happy about having to give them up, which from his point of view you can understand makes him appear weak in the way that, you know, he's constantly telling others not to appear definitely yeah um you know that that, that final scene with avon it really uh in the prison it really kind of establishes that friction and we get a real almost season three state of barksdale beginning to develop with the cops now uh in the pipeline and avon and stringers distrust and kind of semi-contempt but semi-love for one another it's kind of that love hate that starts to really begin showing its head um, you saying just, that reminds me how slowly it really builds like that that distrust between them starts to boil but it's it's very slow it kind of extends from here across into season three it takes its time 
it makes the payoff all that more important as Stringer you know, lets it get away from him. He gets a bit too um, cocksure. Yeah, it's a, it's a huge, uh, huge arc that really takes its time and really pays off for that reason. I think a lot of people cite their favourite scene in The Wire as the culmination of this arc when Stringer and Avon have that chat on the balcony towards the end of season three. Yeah, it's an amazing and, scene, yeah. And their love and hate really comes out, uh, you know, in spades in a re- really big emotional release. Um, I personally think the scene where D'Angelo's true murderer is revealed when Stringer reveals it to him is actually stronger. But, um, you know, but both of those scenes really kind of cap off this this friction and we're seeing it start right here this is kind of at the beginning um which which is really cool um i love the fact that they mentioned the co-op here as well it really cement prop joe's really cemented as a great character now i think for anyone who's who's been skeptical so far and uh we also see that he's the one who instills stringer with his famous line later for all that gangster bullshit it comes directly out of yeah out of prop prop joe's mouth in this scene um and we're kind of seeing Stringer reaching the apex of his learning curve, which has been brewing since the start of the show, really. He's kind of now taking things into his own hands. And as you say, that D'Angelo was the stepping stone. He realized that he could do things behind Avon's back. He could pull the strings and he could get away with it and change Barksdale for, in his eyes, the better. So, what did you think of the actual uh, funeral scene itself? I thought it was another clever use of uh, diegetic music with the the performer and they're singing and there's kind of that really long shot of all the graves. They just seem to stretch out forever and the black mm. tent in the center of the scene. It was uh, yeah. another nice little moment. We see all the characters and the singing continues sort of haunting over the top. It's a, it's quite a beautiful uh, piece of work. Yeah. It's really good to see all the Barksdale's um, in one spot and seeing Prop Joe and the East Side is there as well really cements the strong sense of community there is on the street um, and that you know it's not all about violence and competition but that there is a real sense of love and respect there which is why they're having a funeral in the first place of course like that they understand the importance of of a memorial service and um, it's just really nice to see this in, in the street environment because we're not going to see much more of it not once Milo Stenfield will start chipping away at all this respect. Um, and it was nice to see the different ways people were reacting to the funeral as well, with obviously Brianna and uh, having the worst time, but Stringer obviously silently suffering, I think, and Bodhi perhaps looking on with, with boredom, um, although I think being quite proud of his floral arrangement, which <laughs> uh, did turn out okay, it just... It's sort of a square with a few dots in it. That, that's yeah. a town block, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah, a very it's difficult a thing dig, to make. Yeah. yeah, if you, if I mean, you have to be a serious florist to make it look like a tower block, and you could tell it was a tower block if you were asked to guess what it was. Um, so I also thought it was quite interesting. They went for a kind of wiretapped themed funeral song, "Jesus on the Main Line." Uh, <laughs> I don't really know if they wanted to what, what they were trying to say with that, but it was it was a cool song, and uh, yeah. Overall, I thought it was great. And Poot, Poot was there as well, of course. We haven't seen Poot much this season. Clearly very enthusiastic about the floral arrangement. <laughs> um, and surnames aside, there was a sense that it was one really big family coming together. People that sort of may not see each other very often, but have that kind of close connection through their yeah. uh, through their roots and through through the street, basically. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, there's, there's still a big community here. A lot of big reputations in one place. Yeah. So uh, a great, a great scene there. Uh, a really good uh, episode for the Barksdales um, overall. Should we move things on to the Sabotka detail? Yes. Lots to do right. here. So we've got a fair few segments here. I've split them up into characters. Uh, first of all, we've got this the segment about taking responsibility for the Jane Doe's. This uh, uh, problem that really continues from episode two, I guess, the kind of jurisdiction fight carries on within the department now. So Bunk Bunk and Beady meet with Jay, Sergeant Jay Landsman, to discuss using a computer to monitor dock traffic. He's initially outraged, but is more accepting when he learns that Cedric, or Lieutenant Daniels, has granted them space in his details off-site location. Before storming out, he speculates that Daniels might take the 14 unsolved murder cases, which would relieve the division of the uncleared murders. Rules later calls a meeting with Daniels to try to persuade him to take the Jane Doe homicides. Daniels stands firm. 
Later, in a tense discussion with his wife, Daniels defends his decision to stay with the police department and tells her he is playing their game from now on. She seems unimpressed. So the first bit is the scene with uh, Landsman where they're talking about the computer and uh, again, there's just the complete stats game. People focusing on their uh, targets. Landsman obviously not interested in hearing about any of the uh, techno stuff. Yeah. Um, BD obviously not particularly used to being in that kind of environment. She doesn't really understand exactly what's going on. I would imagine half the time she's in that uh, that homicide office. Yeah. Yeah, as far as she's concerned, this this guy's here to oversee the, the you know the the doing of good rather than to oversee the doing of stats, I guess. <laughs> so it, it really is Landsman going one track minded on the stats. I mean, he doesn't listen to anything else, as you say. He's so averse to what sounds like this really great idea that they've they've got, considering all the leads they've lost as well since they started this investigation back in the first episode. Um, you know, he's just going down the Herc and Carver, um, you know, shallow method really. Um, and it's more about the effort than the result. As soon as he hears that um, Daniels is contemplating the Jane Doe's, he storms out the room and runs to rules. Uh, <laughs> so it's just a complete one-track mind. It's, uh, it's a strange, sad, really. especially considering, like you say, they lost all those leads. They were put in a position where <clears throat> they had a tough case force against them and they, the Atlantic light had gone and they were sort of being heavily criticised for not having any means to solve the case. And they come in with this innovative potential solution and uh, <laughs> they don't exactly get much love back nope not at all it's it's uh, it's quite quite sad really uh, definitely and we really see I guess Daniel's battling with the angels again because uh, there's that scene great scene later on with uh, Daniel's refusing to take rules his murders and it feels like he's really jumped a hurdle from his season one chats with authority where he was constantly being uh, you know horsed around in the corral and he's now standing his ground and rules kind of respects him for it he, you know he's got the the guts to call him smart once he walks out the room so yeah daniel's um stonewalls rules here yeah he, it's um, a really satisfying moment he's got the kind of technique down and like he says to marla later on he's playing their game he's trying to sort of pick up on the little tricks that clearly work yep and daniel's is absolutely right about that and that's what makes it's so so kind of frustrating that Marla seems to be incredibly harsh and close-minded about it. She she seems to think that Daniels is is constantly being taken for a ride without knowing all the facts and um, just seems to take a very clinical and harsh approach to their relationship. Um, that's certainly my take on it. I'm I'm sure she's got her own reasons for that, but uh, it's a very frustrating scene to watch when he's he's kind of in negotiations with her. Clearly she had something very different in mind um, later on when she says that, uh, you know, she fell in love with uh, Cedric's ambition. You yeah. know, it could be argued that uh, he does have quite a lot of ambition based on what he's trying to do and the, the major crimes unit that he wants to get going. But she obviously has a different idea of what the ambition is. Um, yeah. And that causes a irrevocable rift between them. Definitely, yeah. It's... Um it's unfortunate because Daniels is, is very much in the right um, and it just it doesn't quite translate. Um, right, our next Sabotka strand is uh, about Gregs and Prez who are a bit of a double act for this episode. Yeah. Um, so Gregs and Prez follow up on the information they got from Chardine, uh, from Chardine's friend at least, and they find a strip club employing Eastern European dancers. Gregs and Prez watch as the girls leave the club and file into a van. They then trail the van to its destination, an apartment building where all the girls are being kept on the sixth floor, as Prez discovers. So it's a fairly short strand, but um, I thought it was quite enjoyable. Yeah, there's a couple more great Prez cringe faces here. Yeah. Uh, where he's kind of and, being uh, egged on by Gregs, which is pretty funny. Greg's really knows how to, you know, milk all the uh, uncomfortable tension out of him. <laughs> uh, grab any ass prayers. So uh, it's I, I thought I thought it was it was very much uh, a pretty funny pretty funny moment. And it was cool to see them working as a little duo to um, try and get as close to the girls as possible. With the the lobby hotel man being quite uh, close, well, keeping a close eye on them anyway. But not like a memorable double act or anything. No, if you look back on the wire and think about all the duos, specifically you know, in the detail, you don't really think of Gregs and Prez, do you? 
No, I'd, I'd, I'd never think of them as a duo. I, I, they're kind of, I guess these scenes are quite uh, memorable just for the, the kind of uh, the strip club nature of them. Um, that's, that's kind of a big theme of season two. But the, the actual relationship between the two, there's not a lot of chemistry to it. But um, as you say, it's just kind of a, a, a nice way to find some cheap laughs with Prez. <laughs> Yeah, and then Greg's points out the uh, a lot of girls, a lot of muscle. Yeah, so they're able to pick up on the fact that, uh, like Shardine's friend was saying, they're kind of not given any freedom. They're just escorted everywhere, painting the I picture think, of a really yeah. quite um, you know depressing life. And they must have been quite surprised because I imagine they were thinking that Shardine's friend would have been really blowing things up and exaggerating, but it, it really does match up with her description perfectly from the last episode. Uh, they're, they're really not allowed barely to the toilet um, on, on their own terms. So, quite eye-opening. Um, on to a, a slightly more action-packed strand with Herc and Carver. Um, Herc and Carver purchase a, a remote audio surveillance bug to get information above street level on the drug trade. Carver is dubious of the cost, which is one and a quarter thousand dollars, uh, with a policeman's discount, but Herc persuades the shopkeeper to let them have it for a trial period of 48 hours in exchange for the store keeping Carver's credit card, as Herc's card is maxed out, apparently. Um, they are hoping to return it as soon as they ever meet on record. They place the bug in a tennis ball without the necessary paperwork and have some success monitoring Frog. However, when Nick arrives, Frog distractedly picks up the ball from the gutter and bounces it repeatedly on the sidewalk, eventually tossing it into the busy street. Panicked that his credit card is on the line, Carver tries chasing the ball in the heavy traffic, only to watch helplessly as it's thoroughly demolished by a Mack truck. Later on, Herc and Carver plan to fraudulently claim to work with a confidential informant to recoup the cost of the surveillance bug. Herc insists that Carver register the confidential informant because Carver has the trustworthy look. Nick is unknowingly picked up by the surveillance of Carver and Herc. That uh, doesn't even sound like a normal um, part of a recap, does it? There's so much outlandish stuff going on there. Yeah. I mean, uh, here is a comic relief section, if there ever was one. <laughs> we start off with uh, Head, Dick Head, with a Carver, <laughs> Carver doing a British accent there. We're talking about accents. Yeah. Um, and uh, <laughs> Herc keeps going on about the uh, modern urban crime environment, which becomes a buzzword for yeah. much of this uh, episode between the two of them. <laughs> and uh, that incredible cost for that sort of, whatever it is, creme de la creme uh, bug. $1,500 or something. What is that place that they go to? Is it? It's like a it's kind of part armory, part kind of FBI storage cabinet. It's not really... <laughs> yeah, I, I think it was just a gadget shop, was it? I mean, there, there are those kind of novelty gadget shops. I think you don't see them so much now because technology is becoming... A $1,500 surveillance kind of, bug is not a... Yeah, it's, it's not a, a novelty s- gadget, though. That's silly a serious idea. piece of hardware. Yeah, it's, it's, clearly, it's, it's clearly a fun way to, you know, novelize policing a little bit, but it's a stupid, stupid investment. And no, uh, I, I guess, I, I mean, I don't really know a whole lot about... Uh, you know, going out and buying something like that, but uh, I'd just be interested to know exactly where you, you would buy something. They just seemed to go to some store, didn't they? It didn't seem like a police resource or anything like that. It must be a specific yeah. place so they get that that uh, equipment from a private uh, private company. And the, the the wire normally sets up things like that. It always um, states the motivations of its characters, but we do, as you say, just end up here without any explanation. Um, and I hadn't given it much thought, really, but yeah, maybe they were just looking for a little fun fun little side diversion uh, a little bit bored with their surveillance and suddenly got a you know a eureka moment when they found this little bug just uh, hoping it might go the whole way and have it be like that scene in the Simpsons where Homer goes to buy a gun and it has all those crazy um, add-ons for the gun where it's like a silencer and a loudener and a <laughs> speed cocker and this is for shooting down police helicopters <laughs> yeah yeah. Well, there you go. That's, so that's I just what would like hoping. to know what this place is. Is it like Herman's Gun Shop? Is what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, did you see any guns in there? I I, I really should have been looking at the background. I have to have another look. Um, I don't think so. I think it it just yeah. seemed to be like gadgets and stuff like that. But it was clearly, you know, high range stuff. So yeah. You know. But yeah. So I liked uh, Herc's line about his card being maxed to the max. Maxed to the max, man. <laughs> yeah. Um, which is a classic. Carver ends up taking quite a lot of. Um, 
quite a lot of the falls for Herc here. I mean, obviously, there's the credit card in the beginning, and then later on, you know, Carve has to register the confidential in, uh, informant because uh, he has a kind of more trustworthy look, apparently. <laughs> Yeah, which is one of the few correct things Herc says this episode, um, which is fair enough. And he also has to do, do all the physical running work as yeah. well. As well, Herc it's, seems. it's his card. Yeah, so. yeah, it's true that. So, but it's it, a great example of how much of a, a funny duo they are. Really, um, really owning their stripes is the comedy comedy um, strand of the week, and um, they set up this big gadget trip bound to go wrong from the start really and I thought it was just a welcome respite from kind of the rest of the episode which is becoming really intense the story's really picking up now and it's so dedicated to its police kind of um, career stories that it's a nice little break really and I did think it was kind of ridiculous how Carver could take off from an upper floor you know from an upper floor of an apartment building and run down to the street at the same time as the tennis ball lands um, but I mean hey it's about time they threw in some dramatically ramped up chase scene because it's been very very slow so far this season and uh, I, I was happy it was there. We have some sequences of Carver running every now and again, there's a couple in season one I think. He's yeah. shown to be a active guy uh, they do uh, do have a little moment, to, like you say quite a bit of respite considering all the drama going on in all the other sections but they really do go the whole way with the comic relief here with the truck like yeah. keep driving off and the fact that he like stops and goes back and then runs over it again you're like wow this is like animaniacs or something like looney tunes kind of uh moment it was the same the level way. of intensity as when kima got shot but with a tennis ball wasn't it that was that's, <laughs> that's kind of what they were going for here particularly with every single wheel of that truck hitting the ball i mean that has some serious uh <laughs> they did, unlucky they did milk it. Physic- yeah <laughs> it just you felt every single crunch uh it's it's pretty hilarious, and um, I just thought quite funny again that despite all their day of messing around and having fun with a bug, at the end of the day, Herc still completely forgets the the name of the target of their case. Like he's completely focused on the fun rather than the case. And Carver's just about got enough sense to make the, the Sabotka link when they come across Nick uh, as the dealer. Yeah, yeah they do remember so. to actually kind of dial it into police work. Yeah, in the end. Although, uh, not without this obviously very spurious CI, and then the birth of Fuzzy Dunlop. Yeah, and it's great that they actually take their original bug and make it a CI, you know, Fuzzy Dunlop, uh, as in the fuzzy tennis ball, it's a a fantastically (laughs) clever CI. Sounds like you need someone way cleverer than Herc to come up with with that. It comes up a lot later on, doesn't it? I think it's again in season... Possibly season five, where he mentions it to um, what's the name of that lieutenant that comes in and like breaks details. What's his name? The really grumpy one. Oh, Marimo, is it? Marimo, that's his name. Yeah, I remember he has to mention Fuzzy Dunlop to uh, him as well. So it kind of yeah. <laughs> come this uh, this sort of pretend CI does pop up in a couple of other places throughout. Yeah, although I they do find a real CI. Like, I think Herc's cousin does some snitching for them or something, doesn't he? Um, if you recall, it's quite coming up quite soon. I, mm. I don't remember the full story with that, but Fuzzy Dunlop is is the main dude, and uh, a great CI he is. <laughs> um, and I thought thought it was um, pretty cool that as soon as they showed Herc sh- holding that tennis ball and saying "snug as a bug in a rug," uh, they instantly cut to a uh, a red lorry on the computer screen. You know, kind of foreshadowing the fact that it's about to get clobbered by a lorry, um, which I thought was um, a nice bit of foreshadowing. All right, nice. Uh, yeah. yeah, I hadn't, uh, I hadn't thought about that. Because the, the the red lorry is the one that actually runs it over. See, so, yeah, that's quite a big uh, sort of sequence of uh, comedy events there. Yeah. So the next um, section. Yeah. So we next come on to. Uh, we have two more Sabotka detail strands. We have the surveillance itself. So Lester and BD continue to study the drug traffic through the docks by using their cloned computer. Freeman watches clean checkers at work just to familiarise himself with how things work. Following a stage patrol of the docks by BD, Frank feels comfortable putting Horseface back on the Greek's containers, assuming that the investigation has folded. 
When they pick up Horse Face working a ship, they call in Kima and Prez for help with surveillance. Soon enough, BD sees him lose a container, and they follow it back to Double G's warehouse and see Sergei meeting with Prop Joe. Greg's photographs the encounter. Rhonda informs the detail that as they have not discovered a link to the drugs, their currently discovered evidence of criminal activity does not give them the necessary legal requirements to engage in wiretap surveillance on them. So right at the beginning there, we see Freeman's love for the attention to detail, and he's just sat there quite happily watching all of these clean checkers at work, just waiting to be able to pick up on the differences when they start actually taking stuff. Yep. Which is kind of nice, uh, you know, reinforcement of his character. Definitely. Although, isn't it kind of really simple when they're taking stuff, the can disappears off the screen? Um, I just was wondering what he might be observing. But uh, I suppose maybe... so. But if they, if there's a sense that cans may disappear legitimately as well, they may be looking for. That's true. Uh, so that any differences there may be, trying to spot not just the differences between cans disappearing and not, but something that may suggest the nature of why they're disappearing. Is there a pattern or... I guess there Whether could be something to the be gained there. Yeah, that's true. I hadn't considered that. That's a good point. Um, I thought it was... Because um, the they wouldn't have put that into the system unless there was like a legitimate means for it. Yeah. They're not going to... The programmers presumably weren't like, we'll make it so that the cans can disappear just in case anyone wants to nick anything. <laughs> yeah. So I guess there's a, you could kind of figure it out that way. But either way, Freeman is quite happy to sit there and uh, eat it all up. Yeah, definitely. It's uh, exactly what he wants from his case. I thought it was... <clears throat> Savok was very easily convinced, I thought, by Beedy. Um who seems to come along and acts fairly badly uh, in front of him, saying how the investigation's folded and uh, we're back on the docks, but miraculously I'm moving. I'm not going to be here tomorrow. I'm at the other dock. Um, so, and then uh, it's, I just didn't quite buy it. I, th I thought they'd need to have done at least another couple of days of, of the roaming to really convince Frank, who is a smart, cautious man. Um, so I, I'm not sure I quite bought that, but... I it's guess cool he that... trusts Speedy. I mean, she must have suggested that she's been there quite a while and they have a certain relationship, so maybe he's just willing to trust her. He happens to have his guard down at that moment. Yeah. I did think that um, it was a surprisingly good setup on following that truck for how long they had to respond to it. Because yeah. presumably they wouldn't have known Where it was any going. of those details already. So when they see the trucks yeah. disappear, they then have to set everyone up. And, you know, you've got Bunk and Prez and Kima, and they're all kind of set up in the right place. It seemed like yeah. a very well thought out setup, considering it wasn't clear how they managed to do it all in time. Yeah, I, th I thought it was fair enough that they, because they knew Horseface would be disappearing a can or two, they obviously set people up along the docks. But I thought it was certainly strange that they managed to set Bunk up like next to the warehouse where the, the truck goes to ground. It's like they'd even preordained the route that it would take. So um, it was it was kind of kind of weird. It was nice because it, it was a sleek scene and it flowed yeah. nicely. And you kind of you know the, it it uh, made sense in and of itself. But um, it was an unusual moment to be dropped into it. And like you say, the wire takes a certain pleasure in describing the details and the way that things build towards a conclusion. And then here, we don't really get that. We just have the, the action straight up. Yeah. yeah it's, a, it's a really nice scene. As you say, it's got a good structure to it and the way everyone has their role to play. And they're playing a very cautious game with the tailing. Like I think three, three or four different tails um, just to make sure Sergei doesn't get spooked. So um, that, that was pretty clever and um, really nice use of the teamwork. And just a really nice bit of tension and excitement, I think, after what's been, as I was saying before, a very sluggish start to the season. This is now really where their investigation has taken off. And we're, we're kind of deep into the investigation. We really feel it. And you included uh, the section where they have um, Ronda. Ronda. That's right. Ronda's finally back in the show after, um, now that they have real evidence of dirt being done, she can come along and start prosecuting. Unfortunately, though, there's a very familiar to season one tone where bureaucracy and laws are kind of barring them from doing things that deserve to be simple. And in this case, the the wiretap probable cause needs to have a people trafficking connect. Well, actually, it needs to have a drug connect rather than a people trafficking connect. So just another another example of how the laws aren't quite fit for purpose. Um, 
at the moment. Yeah, the it takes an opportunity to. Um, it's a similar scene actually to the one that we had with the prison warden um, right after what was going on with the um, hot shots, and they make a statement about prison about how you can't keep drugs out of prison. You know, how are you going to keep them out of society as a whole? It's kind of making a statement there. We have a similar moment here with Beedy and Perlman when um, yep. they kind of talk about the fact that you can uh, you can spy on someone if they're uh, selling drugs, but if they're selling actual people, they're selling women, like it's uh, somehow that's okay. Yeah. And that yeah, is the true. law, as, uh, as Rhonda says. <laughs> Pretty crazy. Uh, I thought it was a great eureka moment, though, when we realised that um, when we saw Prop Joe going into the warehouse, into Pyramid Inc., and uh, you suddenly get this big, you know, eureka moment where you see that the Doc storyline is connected to the Street storyline, and that you know it hasn't been a waste of time; it hasn't just been a complete tangent, and that everything is connected, right as right as Freeman said. Every, all, you know, the all the pieces matter. Exactly. So I. I I, I love that it really feels like the season picks up here because everything really starts folding into each other um, at this point. Yeah, and, it's, nice. you know, it, he even he even mentioned it at the funeral, you know, my, my shit comes fresh off the boat. Hmm. Yeah, we see more of that later on. That's for sure. Definitely. The way the whole operation just opens up more and more. Yep. Uh, yeah, anything more on the surveillance? Or do you want me to do the last... Um, uh, no, I think we can move on. Sure. Okay, so um, the final bit is uh, more responsibility for Jane Doe's. So um, Bunk, Freeman and uh, BD decide they must persuade Daniels to take on the murders because he will permit the kind of investigation they feel they need to run. Freeman makes an impassioned plea to Daniels, successfully convincing him that it's imperative the detail takes on the 14 murders he has been resisting all along. As a result, Daniels later visits Rules again to inform him that he's willing to take on the case as long as he gets Rules full support on any request for extra support. Rules gleefully agrees to the bargain. Uh, Daniels is far less successful, however, at selling the idea to his wife. When Daniels tells her he loves his job, she replies, the job doesn't love you. She reminds him that she fell in love with his, him for his ambition and he's lost his way. She exits the room in disappointment and anger. So what did you think of Daniel's change of heart here? Because, I mean, you mentioned that obviously um, Lester makes a plea to Daniel's, but it's quite short and he basically just says, do you want that on your conscience? Which mm. is a perfectly reasonable statement, like he kind of makes a good point. But Daniel's also seems to change his mind quite quickly there. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's sort of maintaining keeping this... Uh, this major crimes unit in the future he wants to get that sorted he wants to get this case sorted he wants to keep it clean you know he's said on multiple occasions how he's not willing to take on those uh, bodies he's made quite a few concessions already Freeman kind of goes for his guilt and then he changes his mind and it may be, it may be a little sudden yeah it, I, I agree that it, it wasn't thought through properly I thought it was quite um, harsh of Daniels to really um manipulate Daniel's emotions like that really um, as a man who uh, understands the chain of command um, but it clearly works Freeman's clearly a master talker because something Daniel was, something that he said really clicked inside of him um, and Daniel was really perhaps felt laden with guilt and I think Daniel was, perhaps did that because he is one of the good guys he knows that it's all about at the end of the day the work and you know um absolving these these girls of their murderers um you know still being out in out there and when he thinks of it like that and takes away from the bureaucracy and the politics perhaps he just decided that you know i need to do what's right here and i need to stay away from things but yeah it's it's i, I think it needed more work definitely as you say and uh you could have also added more uh, you know it could, more could have been done with it to emphasize perhaps his interest in the way that he influences those under him as well. Because, like he says to Carver, about how if you make it about the work, it will be about the work. Mm. He's always, you know, especially as time goes on, but we see it here, he kind of wants to um, he wants to be a leader in that sense. He wants to be a good uh, be a good guide, as it were, towards what the right thing to do is. Um, yeah. So here, 
maybe that's what uh, Leicester is able to grab a hold of, his guilt, but also the sense that he wants to be a good leader, he wants to do the right thing, like you say. Lead by example. And obviously they might be using that as a nice way to uh, contrast with the Barksdales who spend this whole episode shrugging the guilt under the carpet and not putting it on them. And... Daniels, you know, has to take the opposite approach, which is it's nice to see a bit of both both camps there. Yeah, it was certainly, I mean, it wasn't sort of badly done, but um, I think an argument can be made that it was just a little sudden. I did kind yeah. of feel that watching it again when he just kind of goes into the office and he's like, ah, oh, I'll take the murders. Like, <laughs> yeah. Rawls is uh, understandably very happy. He doesn't even want to know why, does he? He doesn't even care what changed his mind. He's just, it's changed his mind, that's all I need to know. Happy with that that smirk that he gives it's, yeah. uh, it's, it's pretty it's pretty splendid so I guess that decision kind of sets two things into motion it kind of nails the final coffin in his marriage uh, mm. but it also saves McNulty from flying off into chaos because uh, Daniels now has the leverage to bring McNulty back um, as McNulty kind of falls further and further into irrelevance and craziness and drunkenness and all sorts of weird car crashes as we'll see <laughs> so um, it's nice that they've set up that plot point as well um, and like you say, this is uh, pretty much the end of uh, Cedric's relationship with Marla. And that light going off is you know, very telling. Yeah. That's kind that, of its that's lights it, off, that's it? the end. I guess she's given him, what, three or four chances? I think they've had three or four discussions like this now over season one and season two. And uh, I guess it's that, that kind of impulsive decision change uh, in the space of a couple of days that really did it for her. So it's it's harsh, but I, I guess that's just what what they want from a relationship, or certainly what Marla wants. It's very functional and very very kind of corporate. Uh, the show but, has done a good job of showing us that these two clearly want very different things, and the impact that that has on their relationship. Um, and they really do kind of spell it out more in this scene, just as it comes to a head. Mm. Um, so yeah, I th- it makes perfect sense. I mean, you know, Marla wants something else. She kind of is going for that more sort of slightly safer. I mean, we talked about it before, kind of going for that stability. That's yeah. what she wants. Makes sense for her to, to break it off in that way. I mean, she, you know, she wants to focus on her own work. She doesn't want to be burdened by having to deal with uh, Daniel's problems all the time. Yeah. And about he has to deal with the bosses and he's playing this different game. She thought he had changed. Now he's dropping right back in again. In again so any yeah. hope that she had for progress there is clearly been thwarted so it makes sense the light goes out that's pretty much the end of it I think that the relationship has been really effectively built though I, I, you really feel like Daniels is a product of that relationship uh, yeah. just with his lack of emotion and a uh, very kind of focused outlook on life and very ambitious as Mar- I'm sure Marla's whipped him into ambitious shape um, I, but it's nice to see that as his relationship with Ronda grows starting from next season um, you know he kind of develops the ability to smile and uh enjoy his relationship for different reasons uh so it's really nice to see that and this is another big transition zone i guess in the same way that avon and stringer kind of meet their own transition this episode the um the show doesn't spend too much time with uh marla and daniels together in those the same scene so sort of those relationship scenes but uh yeah they do a very good job of building the relationship up and we understand the uh the dynamic between them and kind of where yeah. they conflict. So, yeah, it's uh, did a good job. It was very economical with the time they had together. Definitely, yeah. Absolutely. The show never shows too much of, of anything. It shows enough so they understand it. Um, and then and then we carry on. Not only that, but too many sort of domestic scenes would take away with a lot of what we're used to on The Wire. Yeah, yeah true. As much as we enjoy them, if there were too many of them, then you know they wouldn't be what they are. They, they wouldn't be that break and that uh, different kind of tone for when when they do turn up. Uh, it's pretty worth mentioning as well. Honorable mention for the the humble motherfucker with a big ass dick. Uh, <laughs> one liner from Bunk, uh, which is a lot of Very people's favourite. Very popular favorite. Bunk line, yeah. Yeah. So that's that's when uh, Freeman and Bunk are kind of uh, planning how they're going to get Daniels to to sway into the into the murders into the Jane Doe's and they don't really need to plan it at all I think Freeman seems to have it have some sort of Jedi magic underneath him so yeah 
Um, okay, so that takes us to the end of the Sabotka detail. We now just have the dock business to look at. So we're going to start with uh, Nick and Ziggy. Um, and then we'll go on to Frank. So uh, Nick gets further involved in illegal activity and sets himself up as a supplier to Ziggy's dealer contact Frog. Later, Nick brings a thick roll of bills to Ziggy at Dolores' bar. His share of the first drug profit plus money uh, that Frog owed him from earlier dealings. When Ziggy fails to show appreciation for the windfall because the drug operation was supposed to be his domain, Nick pushes him. Ziggy shows him a letter from a law firm claiming he has fathered a child with a notoriously promiscuous local woman. <laughs> Nick realises that the letter should have been hand-delivered by personal service rather than mailed. He spontaneously calls the, law's, uh, the law firm's number and immediately a cell phone across the room rings. It's Maui's cell phone. Half amused, Nick tells Ziggy he, that he has been the victim of a prank. Later, Maui continues to taunt Ziggy with a song, Love Child by the Supremes, from the jukebox, and the other stevedores try to convince Ziggy he could take, them, he could take the much bigger Maui in a fight. <laughs> Nick then lies to Amy about his newfound source of income and excites her with a more confident promise that they will soon have a place of their own. There's quite a lot of stuff there. So if we start with... Um, yeah, I guess the main thing that I can think of is uh, Nick dealing with Frog. And uh, I think that Nick deals with him very well here. <laughs> kind of tries to bring him down a peg or two. And it's interesting to see... I suppose I don't know. It depends on what you what your take on is it here. But um, Frog's kind of he describes him as a wigger, doesn't he? He's got got this fake, trying to seem like he's got these street smarts on a level that he's got these these roots. He's got this understanding of the street, when in reality, like Nick says, he has a very different background and he's just it's just a big pretending, basically a big acting job. Yeah, but I I think this is a good Nick scene. I like how he is here. He seems almost wise in a way yeah definitely it kind of feels like a sister scene to the one with Ziggy from episode 5 uh, and as you say Nick is demonstrating how to very effectively intimidate drug dealers uh, the opposite of what Ziggy did yeah and um, uh, yeah it's, it's good to see Frog up close and he's a very difficult character to understand and uh, define but <laughs> he certainly certainly slings dope in, in this part of town and uh, his street talk is pretty damn hilarious it's yet another uh, comic distraction in an episode full of them The The Wire is becoming really really funny actually um, from where it started I think season one was really very much uh, a very serious season and they've really discovered this sense of humour as season two's gone on and uh <clears throat> Uh, it, Nick really feels good at the end about the authority that it, it almost didn't, you know, he didn't appear to know he had it in him until he spoke to Frog like he did, and uh, he was then brought back down to earth when he has to face who he's become again. He has that kind of guilt, that sense of am I a crook? Am I not a crook? When that woman stares down at him from next door, really disparagingly, you know, just another drug dealer in my stoop, and. Uh, so it's kind of picking off almost where D'Angelo left off uh, the character who goes through the morality battle at every turn, which I thought was nice to see in that scene. Yeah, it's uh, it's good. It's um, like you say, it's interesting to see that uh, that elderly lady kind of poking her head out of the door, and she kind of looks like she's stuck in there. It looks like she's kind of been barricaded in there. This siege of uh, drug dealers outside her house. Yeah, and um, like you say. Nick is indistinguishable from Frog as far as she's concerned. Yeah, and Nick just doesn't like that that, that sense of, I guess, you know, that lack of importance, that lack of um, acknowledgement. And um, it was weird to see Nick just then wander in and lay out his drug business in front of the whole bar. There, there was no sense to, you know, put it on the down low. Um, but I guess it speaks to the bond of trust these men have. Like, Nick just walks in and says, you know, Ziggy... Here's the first take from our drugs. Like, <laughs> and, you know, it's just uh, a, a very open environment. And uh, it kind of got me thinking about the portrayal of different institutions in the show. Um, and as far as institutions go, the stevedores seem to be at one end of the spectrum and then the Stanfield crew are perhaps at the other end uh, where everything must remain under lock and key and everything will be used as leverage against you. And the stevedores, the circle is tight. Everyone's, uh, you know, every man for every man sort of thing so it's I, I thought it was interesting to see see that that one level for of one and one for all kind of that's thing. it yeah. yeah absolutely so it's kind of the, the the two ends of the spectrum there the 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 bond of trust and the bond of 
I want to kill you. And despite um, how uh, sort of eloquent and experienced Nick may have seen whilst he uh, sat on that stoop and lectured Frog, he does go on to be pretty foolish. I mean, in the bar, like you say, he kind of flashes the drug business quite casually. But he does also ignore his own advice um, when he talks about um, talks about Ziggy kind of not not flashing it around and not drawing attention to himself. And we see later on that he's he's like bought a new truck, um, and now he's going to try and convince uh, Amy that he's got some new job that's bringing in quite a lot of money, and he's going to go for the new house and everything. He's not really following his own advice about keeping it uh, on the down low until he's really secured his position. Yeah, that's a very good point, actually, yeah. I, I mean, mean, he's really only just leaning into it in the grand scheme, scheme of things. He's not like the Greeks where he's been going at it for years and he's sort of, you know, old and grey in the business. He's just getting a little bit cocky. Um, and, yeah, it's, uh, it seems a little hypocritical. I mean, Ziggy is of, he's completely on another galaxy in terms of foolishness, but uh, Nick is showing a few cracks under the surface here. Yeah, very good point. Um, as far as flashing the cash goes, Ziggy and Nick have very different interpretations of that, I think. But it's still definitely true that he does kind of perhaps fall victim to that money. Once he has a taste of it, he realizes that it's difficult to to kind of fight the the lures of the lures of advertising and capitalism and the, the wanting to have that that nice Jeep and wanting to have that you know to be able to use the money that you earn. That's that's kind of the point you have it right. So uh, staying as the Greeks do, completely completely off the flash is takes a lot of self-restraint, um, which is probably something he discovers. And it gives us an insight to the point of view of those at the very top of the financial chain, especially like the developers and the politicians. Um, we see kind of Nick, someone in a position of financial insecurity, getting this windfall and beginning to abuse it. And in a sense, that follows on that, that idea of greed if you continue on that path and you end up in a position where you're sort of gaining more wealth, you can kind of see how it just becomes about the money and it becomes about gaining more and more security or perceived security. In a way, we get an insight into the slippery slope uh, of greed. Yeah, that's a very good point and a point that's made very subtly because I've never really considered that before. Um, so, yeah, very nice, very nice kind of thought. And then we have the scenes in the bar and Maui... Uh, teasing Ziggy. You'd think uh, him playing that song over and over again would be a bit of a giveaway, wouldn't you? Like, are they just it's, not listening to the lyrics? Do they just think they're playing the same <laughs> tune? Or? It's, it's, it's a very clever way of sending a kind of subliminal message because it doesn't matter what song is playing, you're never going to assume that, you know, that that's kind of, uh, you know, you'd always assume it's just a coincidence. So it's, it's clever when they finally realise that they've been duped the whole time, uh, <laughs> not only through the letter, but through the music, as you say. From shyster, shyster, and shyster. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's a fantastically brilliant pr- uh, prank. And uh, I, I don't know whether you're on Ziggy or Maui's side. Uh, I guess you should really be on Maui's side because Ziggy is a, you know, a, a reprehensible person, really. Uh, but I found it odd how much I always sympathise with Ziggy in this scene. And... Uh, I know he gets a hell of a lot of hate from the community, but I do I do really side with Ziggy. And even Nick sees the funny side to it by the time he realises how apt the jukebox song is, which is a nice touch. I suppose we're used to seeing that kind of puerile behaviour from Ziggy when we see it from Maui. I guess maybe we expect something better, especially seeing as he was the victim of it when Ziggy put all those you know dicks on his computer. Mm-hmm. Um, Maui kind of getting his revenge here. I suppose even though Ziggy is a lot more put upon character in a slightly more desperate situation, or certainly it's presented to us in that way, and we spend a lot more time with Ziggy, so as a result, we're more connected to him. But yeah, you know, even when Maui does it, I guess there's uh, you should still be against him. It's uh, unwarranted. It's a bit uh, cruel, even if it is a bit funny as well. Yeah, so, and this is the cruel. beginning, uh, like you mentioned before, we have. Um, the other stevedores, they're like trying to egg him on. They're trying to convince him that he could like beat Maui in a fight. And uh, this continues on, I believe, in the next episode where he does actually try and uh, hit Maui and uh, <laughs> it has literally no effect whatsoever. It's like he's slapping him. And he ends up on top of the containers, yeah, doesn't he? Yeah, that's great, oh, it's isn't it? brilliant. So it kind of gets his comeuppance the there. I mean, yeah. you know, whose side you're on there, I mean, it's got to be Maui's because if you're going to go around 
someone uh, Ziggy style, you're going to go around picking fights with big guys like that. You've got to know exactly who it is that you're messing with. <laughs> you can hardly be surprised when he's going to do something like that. Lucky he didn't uh, seriously hurt him. Yeah. Yeah, it's very true. And I think we get the first mention of Ziggy's kind of inf- um, unofficial nickname, the Legend of the Docks, yeah. as he is known. So he's clearly en- a very entertaining presence for everyone around him. He's, he's kind of gone from at least attempting to have some semblance of a life and some semblance of a career with all these failed attempts at being a drug dealer to literally just, you know, the Steve Doors play thing. He's just the product of, of humiliation now for the past couple of episodes. So he's really, really fallen quite far. I um, thought it was interesting that someone must have put that fake um, paternity suit letter together because it was quite quite a sort of ream of papers and it looked like an official document. Somebody must Mm. have spent a bit of time putting that together. Yeah. Although I suppose it's established, especially Maui, being a checker, to some extent he's got to be computer literate, so... I guess he knows how to do that, copy something off the internet and uh, change it a little bit. Yeah, and as Nick says, uh, he he had experience with paternity papers and he saw that it was a bit of a fake, it was a fraud, it had didn't have the, it had some sort of some omission. So perhaps it's a bit of a thing amongst these stevedores to be served with these papers and perhaps they just kind of templated it and just inserted a chest of Sabotka rather than whoever else so well i think what it was yeah. is that it has it's legally required to be delivered um, that's it by the lawyer person yeah it's meant to be sort of a, de- a de- personal service rather mm. than just mailed to you yeah that was it so so yeah it's quite a good selection of scenes there yeah again a very very funny interlude um okay so let's let's go and see frank So, Frank attends a seminar on robotic dock technology and is appalled when he realises the automated systems threaten to make stevedores obsolete. He meets with Nat back at the union offices and appeals to him to let him extend his term as union treasurer for another year, deferring an agreement to alternate between white and black leaders annually. Frank meets with his lobbyist Bruce DiBiago and expresses his frustration with the lack of progress with the politicians, all but accusing DiBiago of playing him and the union. Frank rants about his family's history and its lack of financial security um, before delivering a box of cash and insisting that Bruce work the politicians harder to get the canal dredged. A dock worker called New Charles suffers a severe leg injury while moving fright when his leg is trapped under heavy cargo and severely damaged. The stewardess rush to his aid and he is taken to hospital, but he ends up losing the limb. Frank and Nat visit his family, and Frank delivers a thick envelope stuffed with cash saying it's from the Union. After Nat reminisces about how New Charles got his name, when he arrived on the day old Charles died, Nat pointedly asks Frank where the money comes from. Refusing to answer, Frank simply walks away. So he was moving fright. Fright. (laughs) Fright. I apologise. Yeah. He's moving literal fear. (laughs) Um, <laughs> same thing yeah <laughs> so yeah uh, this this is an interesting turning point for Frank uh, we kind of have that uh, build up in all prologue here in our second half you do get the sense that Frank is becoming a lot more um, narrow minded he seems becoming to be irrational more isn't he yeah um, and he's starting to get a like we've seen already that he's clearly quite a passionate guy he does have a bit of a temper he likes to shout and waves his arm, arms around to get his point across, you get a sense that he's starting to lose it a little bit. Um, and it's a interesting take from The Wire to kind of show these two sides in terms of the robotic technology. Like on the one hand, you see the fact that it's taking people's jobs away. Um, and then on the other hand, there's the element of safety and efficiency. So you, it kind of presents the two sides quite nicely. Frank ends up with a, quite a serious moral dilemma on his hands. And it's, you know, kind of forced through quite heavily with the whole new child's leg injury, uh, yeah. very appropriately uh, bookended by that. Um, but yeah, it's it's certainly a flaw of Sabotka. And I mean, personally, the the automated docks makes a lot of sense. Like, the you know, um, it'll make everyone richer in a macroeconomic sense. And he doesn't see it like the efficiency goes up and the grain peer is a different matter that will um, sorry, that 
take that back. Um, you know, it kind of clearly lays that argument made by the doc storyline on the table, pretty much forces you to pick a side, as you say, I like the way that it really kind of draws the lines. Um, but you can see why the business world is excited about it and why Sabotka isn't. So, I did really enjoy the scene where they uh, followed up the announcement that there's no need for unreliable human surveillance by cutting to Herc listening to the bug through the headphones, um, which I thought was a nice telling kind of transition. Yeah, there's a cut between seeing this utopian Rotterdam dock with all this technology and security and automation, and it's cut in with uh, Herc, who literally says something about, he's like, isn't tech the bomb? That's it, yeah. It's, it's, take kind of the bar. Nice. it's literally a tiny little segment that it cuts in with that scene. It's uh, yeah. very nicely made. Um, like you say, that there's uh, plenty of good reasons for having all this automation and robotics, as is spelled out by the final scene with uh, New Charles. Um, we also see that Frank is so focused on completing his legacy as this like union leader. He kind of wants to create this legacy to leave behind and he's just willing to throw more money at the problem to get told uh, Bruce DiBiago to sort it out for him. Mm. And it ends up leaving, um, like you said, that, that white and black alternation mm. just pushes that to one side. So, yes, yeah, he definitely becomes a lot more selfish here, I think. Yeah, although he was, I mean, it's not necessarily just about him because he is the one who's pushing for that um, grain pier which will get them bigger, you know, much bigger ships, whereas Ott's pushing for the... Um, sorry, um, Frank's pushing for the dredging of the canal, which will get them the bigger ships, and Ott's pushing for the grain pier, which will get them more ships of the same size. So it's clearly just a different idea of what the docks needs, and I imagine, fr you know, the, the actual work per worker will probably go up a lot more with these big, big ships if they can accommodate them, and Frank wants the chance to do that without Ott getting in the way and, you know bringing his idea of what the dock needs into it. Um, so it's, it's, it's a tricky one, definitely. Well, the road uh, to hell is paved with good intentions. Yeah. And uh, n n not many more characters find that out more severely than uh, Frank Sabotka. Yeah, absolutely. And, uh, it's, uh, I'd say that... The, the biggest flaw with Frank is that he's really getting this nostalgic yearning for the glory days that are increasingly irrelevant. Um, and, it, you know, the, just the, this way of life perhaps isn't sustainable anymore. And There is a certain failure to adapt, isn't there? Yeah, and it's just this holding on to the glory days that weren't really that glorious, but they're always inflated in your mind. They're the, the rose-tinted spectacles. Um, he's clearly an emotional man and he's driven by that, but is it really what's best for him? There's cracks starting to show in the Frank kind of uh, mandate. Yeah, there's the impact um, that it has, especially on Ziggy. Um, the fact that we hear from, you will hear DiBiago's story and he talks about how he, you know, about his uh, grandfather or something like that, didn't want his son to uh, end up pushing the uh, knife sharpening uh, cart up the hill either. So, kind of adapting and putting yourself into a position of betterment. Frank saw it that way, but only within the role of the stevedore. He could only see it kind of within that mm. that family business. Um, so, yeah, there's a just a failure to see the bigger picture here. Definitely, yeah. So, and, you know, just he loves taking pleasure in the fact, you know, reminding Dibiago of his lack of social mobility. And um, there's, there's a nice kind of subtext to that whole scene with Dibiago, where you get Dibiago feeling quite guilty as he seems to know that he's taking the money um, on something that he's not going to be able to deliver because um, the city feels differently about Sabotka's issues despite the money. You know, it's, it's it's about building condos on that grain pit. It's never going to be about putting ships there. Um, so his money is kind of going into a brick wall and they Dibiago certainly seems to understand that and isn't doing a very good job of hiding it and almost wants to kind of confess and tell Frank this, you kind of get the sense. But Frank, kind of in a desperate plea, just throws another shoebox of money at him and says, make it happen, make it happen. And there really isn't any way out for Frank, you get you get the sense here. Yeah, that, that's very true. Frank like doesn't have a plan. He's not offering an alternative. Mm. 
So yeah, sadly, this will be a uh, wasted payment. Yep. And then Definitely. finally, we have the scene with New Charles, and um, everyone rushes out of the bar. They kind of find him on the floor, his leg having been crushed by like a large pallet of uh, crates or something like that. And yeah. Frank has to come to terms with the reality if you're going to let people work. Uh, he says so when he's in that meeting about the um, automation. You can't can't get hurt if you're not working. Um, and when he says it, he's just thinking of the how ludicrous it is. Like, oh, we're all very safe, but we're also not working. But yep. uh, the alternative, of course, is ending up in a position where you lose your leg. <laughs> you know, then you're definitely not working. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely the lesser of the two evils, as far as I'm concerned. Um, and you can understand Frank's idea that you know innovation perhaps should be limited to offer, you know, so that there are kind of manual jobs still available to people, but uh, it's it, it it's it's a, a very tricky issue that, that the why is not offering an answer on, um, and the Frank certainly has his ideas about, and uh, with with that with that leg busting, it's uh, made all that all that more difficult. Yes, yeah, that's um, a good point. It's uh, for all of the moments that the wire takes to make statements about things, like we mentioned earlier with the law and uh, prostitutes and drugs in competition. It uh, it does pick also the right moments not to present too clear a picture and not to try and pretend to have all the answers as a TV show. Mm. And it works really well here. Definitely, yeah. It can be difficult when you get shows that are sort of constantly trying to be prophetic in some way yes yeah, definitely not preaching too hard which is what, what you want really you want i'm thinking to... newsroom if you've ever seen that okay i've heard i've heard fairly good things about newsroom actually it's 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 well written but it kind of has a problem where it's constantly trying to make these big grand statements about isn't the world so messed up and kind of okay. having all of these answers having all of this sort of self slightly self-important view on the world but uh, mm. Yeah, let's not get into it too much. Let's okay, see it. interesting. But yeah, have a look. check it out. See what you think. It's not a bad show. It's just tendency to preach. Yeah. And uh, I guess as Stringer and Avon reach loggerheads in the prison, um, Ott and Frank seem to hit their kind of apex of loggerhead as well at the end when Ott sees yet another huge wad of cash come out of nowhere, seemingly uh, into into the hands of new Charles's family. So it's um, a very rocky road ahead for everyone. Yeah, I can't uh, I can't imagine Nat has got much respect uh, left for Frank eventually. Like, it's um, pulling all of this money out of nowhere, not revealing any of the information. Again, we talked about the change in Frank and him becoming more selfish and more narrow-minded and... He also becomes a lot more distant in a sense. You get the se- you get a feeling of him becoming isolated at the top, yeah. um, and that in a way there's an almost father figure element to what he's doing in the union. Yeah, um, which is interesting because he's a better father to the stevedores than he is to his own actual son, <laughs> mm. which is uh, quite damning. But yeah, he I, you kind of feel him becoming a lot more isolated in his position and. That only seems to get worse as the episodes go on. Yeah, definitely. Very good points. Okay, so we're through the dot business. We're going to end up with a very short strand, and it's the McNulty strand. Who we've almost forgotten about. (laughs) Yep. It's very funny to think that McNulty is a really key character following him all the way through season one and him being built up. And then in, in this season so far, it's just been... Almost entirely absent, which is uh, telling of the of the show and its ability to build an interesting ensemble of characters and not have to just rely on uh, one important one. Yeah, absolutely. So, McNulty, currently without an assignment, spends time with his estranged wife Elena watching their sons play in a tent in the garden. Jimmy once again attempts to rekindle his relationship with Elena, but is unsuccessful as Elena admits she can never trust him again. So, we kind of have McNulty's as you say increasing irrelevance being hammered home to us here as they've kind of very deliberately waited right till the end to you know to remind us that McNulty still exists and it really is quite jarring you're like oh yeah hey main character and uh, he appears for a very brief moment and the show is just again reminding us that the show is able to be just as if not more enthralling without him now that he's off the force and 
uh, has nothing to do, has no um, important areas to channel his talent into. And it's a strange situation with Elena as well, who's showing some openness, more than we've ever seen before, of being able to reconcile with him. And uh, it's it's an unusual scene for McNulty. There, there's kind of a lot of a, a lot of emotion um, flowing through it, and we're seeing McNulty outside of his work setting and kind of trying to settle down. And we know that he can't do it. I like you can see his frustration, especially in his desire to. You know, he kind of wants to be close to her, he wants to touch her and everything. He keeps kind of raising his arms as he speaks and kind of having to pull them back again. It's quite nice. Uh, and it's a good call to let him slide into this, you know, purposeful irrelevance, I suppose. He's, you don't want to, you don't want it to become too much of a cliche with his character and him having all these issues and constantly having to prove how smart he is. And kind of we know who the McNulty character is. And if you have too much of that, it just becomes a bit too much of a trope of the show, I guess. So it's a mm. good call to to let him slide away here. It works really well. Yeah, absolutely. And I quite like the way that they place the McNulty scene to parallel the Marla Daniels stuff as well. Yeah. Uh, so that we have a kind of couples parallel to finish with the one side with the ambition and one side with the trust. And both of these men are left in the lurch to finish the episode off. So we've got a nice bit of wire style synergy. Um, and we get Elena with turns the light on in the tent, and Marla turns the light off in the bedroom. So, oh yeah, that's more, true. Yeah, more things. And I don't know whether the spider they're squashing is McNulty or not, but um, it might be going yeah. a bit far. The significance of the spider. Yeah. <laughs> but um, it's there is a more of that very kind of quaint kids arguing. Mom, he's doing X, Y, Z. Like you know, there's kind of that very typical domestic scene, that yeah. respite from all the serious seriousness of the street. Yeah, again, it's it's really nice to see that for McNulty because he's the character you least expect to kind of find in the the quaint domestic setting. It's the only time we ever see it, really. Um, oh, I, I guess there's periods with Beady where he's he's really settled uh, and nice and keeping it domestic. But uh, overall, yeah, it's it's very unusual. So it's good to see it when it happens. Um, so, is there anything else about the like the episode in general that you wanted to cover? Um, no, it was very much, um, I guess, a progress episode rather than a consequences episode, which was last week. Um, things are moving forward. Kind of relationships are really developing, and we we got quite a few people. Becoming at loggerheads, um, uh, some of our key relationships, which is good. So, um, yeah, I thought it was good and more focused than it has been in the past. We only had three major strands here, really, and uh, some of our key characters aren't appearing for the moment. There was um, one extra thing I actually didn't mention about the scene with um, Frank and Bruce, and I liked that little nod towards the you know take a walk in my shoes reference where he kind of takes his shoes out of the out of the drawer and puts them on top and he's like i think they're your size yeah i thought that was a nice little nod a clever way of putting it rather than just oh take a walk in my shoes like just trying to find a different way to to slip that in there which is a nice bit of writing yeah and just in case uh there is a bug in the room it also confirms that he's giving him a pair of shoes rather than a uh a wad full of cash so it's uh <laughs> It's done quite well. Um, yeah, uh, do you want to move on to the to our finest uh, bonus sections, we call them, or the, the little ending? Yeah. Ending moments. Christ, quit pulling your dicks and get this thing off of me. One, two, three. Charlie, here, take a drink. That's the ammo, Charlie. It's the ammo you're hearing. Right over there. Don't worry, kid. You're still on the clock. Have you got a you got a favorite character? Is it possible to have one of those anymore now that we're on such a yeah? yeah such it's a it's a tough one. I'm I think I'm gonna not because necessarily that I like it, but I think it's very well played. Just to how cold Stringer is in this episode, and Idris Elba does a great job of showing well not actually not even chewing just a little bit of teasing the inner turmoil and what he's dealing with and 
how he's going to try and push his luck even further, even though he knows he knows exactly what he's doing. It's a great performance, and uh, like I say, there is a element of Stringer doing his rounds, especially earlier on in the episode, so he gets a bit more focus here, which is nice. Yep, he was certainly a candidate for me. I think I'm going to go with Daniels um, overall. Uh, he's kind of coming back to season one greatness almost uh, with his chats with rules, which really brought me back into it. And uh, it, I really, really just felt for him a lot with the battles with his wife um, and the, the fact that she can't really see past the, good, the, the great things he's doing at work. And he's really playing their game, as he says, and Marla should re- recognize that. And she didn't, so I, I really, really felt for the guy. And uh, I think he was the star of this week for me. Hmm. Yeah, uh, I thought, uh, that's a good yeah. choice, I think. So what about favourite scenes? Again, continues to be tough. Yeah, I think I might go for the landmark funeral, I think, really. Um, or maybe the um, the surveillance in the docks, uh, the kind of action step-by-step scene. Both of those were very good um, for different reasons, very different reasons, as we discussed. Um, also, the McNulty scene at the end, I think, deserves a mention for being so outside the comfort zone of a a McNulty scene Um, and also for its importance in being the only McNulty scene and you know saying spades by being that only McNulty scene that we've kind of dropped our character when we're doing something bold it's um, one of the reasons in particular it's a difficult choice in this episode is as we've mentioned a couple of times just the range in tone across this episode so what comes to mind for me is like for, on the one hand, you have the quite a you know quite a um, famous the fuzzy Dunlop scene and them chasing after, and it has this kind of zany cartoonish feel, especially with the truck and we mentioned before. And then you have the scene with New Charles where he's getting injured and it's kind of this really horribly bloodied leg and Frank mm. desperately trying to make a make light of the situation and that the sort of serious camaraderie between all of the stevedores like it just it's so up and down this episode that uh, it makes it quite difficult because you can't, can't be quite sure whether to go something that's memorable for being funny or for being you know dramatic and and gripping yeah and it, you know it has morning death and and kind of you know laughing at hilarious pranks in equal state sort of equal equal measure doesn't it so yeah, it's it's I, very really kind of plunges the depths of uh, of trauma and uh, raises itself to Laugh out loud comedy. Yeah, that's a, it's a, a very quite good an incredible point. episode, really. Have you managed to pick a moment in particular, or is it just? It's uh, got to be between those two that I mentioned, I think, because they're in a way they're kind of like the there's a real kind of peak and trough there, I think, and yeah. the, the sort of the funeral as well, like you mentioned. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. But it's quite um, unlike the wire to have a scene where there's actual kind of. You know, special effects and blood and gore and stuff like that. It's quite uh, it's quite rare, given the amount of violence there is in the show. Although it yeah. is, there's not a lot of spotlight put on it. It's not trying to romanticise it at all. So, to see this kind of messed up leg and it's kind of does make quite a pointed shot towards it. So, like you say, a lot of range. Sweet. Um, okay, so as far as Horseface tells New Charles. You still don't worry, kid. You're still on the clock. Um, what did you make of that epigraph? Is it one to remember? Um, probably not. I would say um, no. It's just uh, you know covering the themes of uh, people going out of work, scraping by in order to survive, um, dealing with things like the automation and uh, the fact that the situation is so desperate that. Uh, they still have to remind him that he's still earning money even whilst he's uh, going <laughs> to yeah. get rescued by the ambulance. So it's, again, it's quite suitable, I suppose, because much like the episode, it's equal parts tragic and funny. Um, so I guess in that way, it's quite a good partner to the episode, but also just not particularly memorable. No, not at all. It's just hammering home the importance of work to these people and money above all and... Um yeah, it's it's uh, not the best. It doesn't really have much of a, a universal meaning for the show, does it, or for the episode in general? It's interesting uh, to see like two to different it. ways of the sort of 
uh, brotherhood coming together, sort of family coming together. We kind of have the one at the end with the stevedores as they come around New Charles, and then we have the funeral, where everyone sort of coming around the death of uh, D'Angelo. Two very different, uh, two very different senses of family and uh, and cooperation. Yeah, yeah, definitely. They they love them parallels, and we love finding them. <laughs> so our title backwash. Yeah, so... Uh, what are your thoughts on that? This is, again, another kind of ocean term, isn't it? Uh, the is this? I assume it means that once the waves go out, they have to go back in. That's the backwash, right? Um, uh, so that's... I guess that's a metaphor for consequence, right? Uh, whatever you do has to kind of come back and haunt you. Um, could be linked to McNulty's chew. If they chew you up, they've got to spit you back out. Um, and I guess it kind of mirrors D'Angelo from last week, talking about... Um, you know that shit stays with you uh, I just find it a bit of an odd title because this is very much a progress episode as I said not really a consequences one um, so I I couldn't really really find many consequences here apart from perhaps the, the bug that got run over but um, yeah it, it didn't quite ring ring correctly as a as a, uh, a title for this episode yeah when I think of um I think of backwash. I think of somebody you don't want to share your glass of water with. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, I mean, generally speaking, I suppose it's going for a connotation of some kind of, I guess, a consequence, like you said, or some kind of condition that carries on long after what caused it. So it it ties in more to all prologue than anything else because it ties into what D'Angelo was saying about, like you say, things staying with you. Um, so it's quite an interesting connection to this episode. Yeah. So it's perhaps about o ongoing ongoing consequences, the idea of building arcs of consequences and impending doom, like Greek tragedy, I guess. That that, that could be what they're going for, really. Um, I suppose yeah, there is a link to Stringer and um, what he's done and how that's going to stay with him as he continues to make his knowing choices that... Uh, really put him very much at odds with, with Avon, at the very least. Mm. Um, and that's just going to continue. But but uh, nothing... Unless we're missing something really obvious, there doesn't seem to be a particularly solid connection between the title and the episode, which is a shame, because it's quite a cool name, and it's ocean-themed, like you say. Yeah. But uh, not not quite as strong a link as uh, as we might be used to. Yeah. Uh, was, I'm just in. I am very excited by the title of next week, which is Duck and Cover. <laughs> so I I know exactly what's coming in terms of um, Ziggy's new pet, which I'm yeah. uh, I'm looking forward to. So that, I think we'll have more to talk about with that one. It just uh, it's uh, more strong episodes to come. Really, really getting into season two here. I mean, obviously we're past the season, uh, past the halfway point. Sorry, and uh, just as gripped by this as I. As ever have been, basically, just just definitely doesn't get old. Not at all. No, it's it's really picking up, and it's only going to get better. So yeah, that was episode seven, backwash. Uh, thanks very much for joining us again. We'll be back as usual uh, next week, which will be the sixth, sixth of March. I think that'll be, be the that's fourth, next Friday. I think one. It'll be the what next be Friday. Fourth? Oh, sorry, yeah, I do apologise. So, yeah, it's uh, we'll, be, we'll be back as usual then with Duck and Cover. And uh, thanks very much for joining us again. You can check out everything on the website at courtonthewire.wordpress.com and by all means send us any more emails to courtonthewire at gmail.com and we shall see you next week for episode eight. You see you then. Baltimore? What you know about Baltimore? Baltimore. What you know about Baltimore? 